Welcome back. Before we examine functionalism, the currently most popular solution to the mind-body problem, let's update our scorecard for the theories we've already discussed. Remember, the idea is that we're going to measure theories according to how many of the desiderata on theories about minds they can satisfy. The four desiderata that I emphasized are realism about minds and mental states, the causal efficacy of the mental, appropriate generality, they cover the right things, not too few or too many, and underwriting and explanatory science of psychology. These desiderata capture the base expectations of most philosophers, psychologists, cognitive scientists, and neuroscientists who theorize about minds. They're not sacred, we can certainly abandon one or more of them, and they're not the only things we might want out of a good theory. No doubt the list could go on. But we've got to start somewhere, and there's at least a wide consensus that these are desirable features, hence desiderata. We already saw how substance dualism and eliminativism fare on the scorecard. Dualism assures the reality of the mental by making the mental its own kind of substance. But as we saw, dualism faces a challenge when it comes to the problem of mental causation. Because substance dualism is epiphenomenalist, it's hard to see how it could ground a science of psychology. And a dualist might be able to make sure that minds are only in the right things, but that's only going to be by ad hoc measures or literally by the grace of God. So the best we can do is leave its generality as an open question. I'll leave the open questions blank for now. The situation is even simpler for eliminativism. The eliminativist denies that there are any mental states or any mental states of a certain kind. If there are no mental states, then they don't cause anything and there's no science of them. And because we all think we have mental states, we're all likely to think that eliminativism fails on generality. It attributes mental states to too few things. What about behaviorism? We saw three kinds of behaviorism, but here the focus is on behaviorism as a metaphysical theory about the nature of psychological states. Remember, behaviorism starts with the idea that psychology is the science of behavior. So let's give behaviorism credit for underwriting a science of psychology. And behaviorists were not anthropocentric in their science. It was definitely meant to apply not only to humans, but also to non-human animals, and potentially to artificial intelligences and aliens. So let's give behaviorism credit for adequate generality. But then things get a bit more confusing. Remember, B.F. Skinner argued that psychology has no use for inner causes, so denies that mental states are the causes of behavior. Hunger isn't a mental state that causes a syndrome of behaviors and dispositions. Instead, that syndrome is itself hunger. Because hunger is a behavior in this broad sense, hunger is not the cause of behavior. So it seems like the behaviorist is denying that mental causation occurs for the reason that whatever inner causes there may be, those are always physiological and never psychological. So that's a no for mental causation. Now, the behaviorist does think that there are psychological beings, us for example, and that we have psychological states and properties. So we could say that behaviorism is a kind of realism about the mind, but it's important to remember that for the behaviorist, so-called minds are syndromes of behavior and dispositions to behave of the whole organism, and not any inner causes of those behaviors. So if that's what we're looking for in realism about the mind, then behaviorism gets a no. I'll leave it as an open question for you to decide how to score behaviorism on that first desiderata. But if you put a no there, then you should look back down at the last two columns of the chart and see if you should revisit those as well. Now we come to our newest contender, the mind-brain identity theory. This one starts off easy. If sensations are identical to brain processes, then there are definitely sensations because there are definitely brains with processes going on in them. So we're good on realism. Moreover, brains and brain processes certainly have causal effects. So if sensations are brain processes, then they are causally efficacious. Skipping to the last column, if sensations are brain processes, then there can certainly be a science of the mind. Some critics have complained that the science can't be psychology because it would have to be neuroscience. This concern is similar to an old worry that the identity theory is a eliminativist because if sensations are brain processes, then there are no sensations but it's easy to see that these concerns are misguided. When you learn that Wonder Woman is Diana Prince, you don't thereby learn that there's no such thing as Wonder Woman. On the contrary, you learn something about Wonder Woman. Similarly, 
the identification of water with H2O, lightning with electrical discharge, and sensations with brain processes does nothing to undermine our ontological commitment to the first member of each pair, water, lightning, or sensations. And if those things exist, we can have sciences that study them. So we put a check in the last column. This brings us down to the question of generality. Does the mind-brain identity theory have the right kind of generality? Does it assign mental states to the right range of things, not too many or too few? In the 1960s, consensus formed that the answer is no. The mind-brain identity theory is not sufficiently general. It's not the case that something has to have a brain, just like ours, in order to have mental states like hunger or pain. After all, dogs, birds, and octopuses can experience pain and hunger, and their brains are quite different from ours. Moreover, it seems clear enough to many people that we could meet brainless intelligent aliens or build brainless intelligent robots, and it would be nothing short of prejudice to rule out ahead of time that those things could count as having mental states simply because they don't have brains. Put another way, surely it's an empirical question whether things without brains can have sensations, not a question that should be answered by a theory, right? This rhetorical question has served as a second motivation, along with Smart's proposal that we think of mentalistic language as being topic neutral, for the functionalist theory that we're going to study next. We can even think of generality concerns as creating two sets of reasons, one based on aliens and other species, and one based on computers and robots. So next up, Hilary Putnam and the invention of functionalism as a theory of minds. Hey there! This is an introductory class and we can't explore every question in detail, but I'd be remiss if I didn't let you in on a little secret. You see, the debate I just described is exactly what I work on, and I don't mind telling you that I think the mind-brain identity theory can be adequately general. I'll also tell you that I don't think the considerations based on other species hold up under closer examination. As much as I enjoy science fiction, there's a difference between science and fiction. So I'll deal with questions about aliens and intelligent robots after we find some. Finally, as a purely sociological observation about the current state of philosophy and the cognitive sciences, I think one of the most interesting and active areas of study can be understood as the effort to grapple with how to balance the desideratum of generality against the desideratum of causal efficacy. But if you want to talk more about that, you'll need to take some more philosophy classes.